So tonight we're going to do a little, we're going to look at a little bit more application rather than theory, right? The last, last, our first session, we kind of got an introduction. Of course, last week we were very heavily into the calculations involving noise and so on and so forth. I want to fall back a little bit and talk about right, practical application, some of the stuff we've learned so far and how you make sound, sound level measurements and kind of instrumentation used and so on and so forth. Since not many of you have, I brought a couple, I brought a sound level meter and I brought, brought a small dosimeter. In a second, we're going to know what those instruments are, what the difference between those instruments uh, is. But I brought a couple of small instruments that we could pass around, take a quick look at, maybe even make a measurement or two. And maybe if the fan comes on, we can you know, see what, how many decibels that, that are coming out of that vent over there. So, so um, uh, uh, I'll pass those around. We get a look at them and get a little bit of an introduction. But since you haven't taken the lab, I'm thinking that next week um, uh, uh, we tentatively have a guest lecturer on heat stress next week. He'll, he'll be doing at least uh, part of the lecture on heat stress. Uh, so, so we, it's been scheduled ahead of time. So, if he is here next week. Uh, uh, we'll do that for the first part, part of the lab, and then like maybe we'll get into noise measurements again towards the end. Or if it isn't, we'll just do all noise next week. We'll finish up with noise next week. And what I'll do is I'll bring, uh, I'll set up, I'll bring in a speaker, make some white noise, some pink noise, and we'll actually maybe play around with some measurements, take a look at some of the things we that we've been talking about. In other words, the effect of an enclosure, the effect of uh, distance. Uh, from the uh, source and so on and so forth, how, how uh, uh, it attenuates the sound and so on. How we might do how we might do a measurement of uh, uh, the sound pressure levels uh, as a uh, for, uh, as at different distances from the source, so that we can like, kind of map out map out the sound levels as if we were doing an investigation. Um, uh, so it, it'll give us a chance to actually do a little bit of hands-on stuff, even though this is not technically a lab. It'll really help you uh, kind of cement this whole thing. Okay, so one of the things we're interested in is how to calculate the, uh, uh, the dose at the sound pressure level, the actual level of noise that, that is present at the point where the worker might be, and also to calculate the worker's dose. In other words, how much noise is he really getting exposed to? And of course, the dose is not just the intensity of the sound at, the, at that's given moment, it's a combination of the, the sound pressure level and what the length of the duration is. Just like a toxin, right? It's like you know, how much is in the air and how much, how much time he's exposed to it and so on. So we'll, get, we'll take a look at that because I think that's, that, that's important to know about. That's something that you might actually apply. Uh, okay, we'll talk about what's the appropriate measuring devices, what, what the differences are between them. And we'll talk about hearing protection. You might have noticed I brought in a helmet with hearing muffs, and I think I have enough uh, earplugs to be able to pass them out so we can play around with them and talk about the proper way to it. How many of you have ever been trained on the proper way to put in earplugs? Okay, how come? Where were you trained? You were exposed to noise. Yeah, and like what, like what, uh, what in the, you were working in a noisy environment, or, or as part of a, 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 a OSHA course, or. No, so for the, comp the previous company that I worked for, yeah, um, there you go. Okay. potential we were in um, environmental remediation projects, right? Um, to be exposed to noise, so we were talking. About okay, good. All right, there you go. Okay, let's talk about noise measurements. Okay, here's a random bunch of instruments here that we're going to be talking about in a second. Um, in addition to interest, instruments that we use to measure sound pressure levels and measure dose, we also, of course, have to have devices that allow us to calibrate those instruments. A measurement is never any good unless you can rely on it to be accurate, right? So uh, in industrial hygiene, we're always calibrating. Everything we do, we calibrate. Okay, uh, if you do occupational exposures, you're going to want to calibrate all of your instrumentation before you do the exposure measurements. You want to cal calibrate them again after you do the exposure measurements. So, and if you get any, if you're involved in any litigation, one of the things that's going to come off if you have expert testimony is, is they're going to ask you, did you calibrate the instrument? What method did you calibrate the instrument? What does the manufacturer say about how to calibrate it? And so on and so forth. So you have, if you really get involved in, in sound level measurements and there could be any kind of litigation involved, you want to make sure you calibrate it correctly. Is there a way to maximize the screen? Um, you mean make it bigger? Yeah. 
Okay, let's see what I can do. I think I can. That's a little better, eh? Okay, that's about the best I can do. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's the title it's got off. There. Yeah. Is it? Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, so sound level meters. Uh, this measures the sound pressure variations in the air. That's your SPL, your sound pressure level, your uh, uh, micropascals, and so on and so forth. Okay. It provides basically instantaneous readings. That's not really true. It actually, uh, uh, it actually reads over a short period of time from milliseconds up to, say, a full second. In fact, most of these instruments have a setting on them for a fast response or a slow response. When you're doing very sophisticated laboratory work, you may need to have a very fast response if there's a very short duration sound or something like that. But for most of our measurements, we're going to use a, uh, uh, a slow response, which updates every second. It averages uh, readings over a second, roughly a second, and it displays the reading that, uh, for that average for a second. It's, uh, 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 you'll see the numbers change like every second or two. The fast response, they're just you know, dancing through the uh, instrument. It's very hard to get a reading on. Oops. Okay. Okay. One of the things that we're going to use a sound level measurement device in this, uh, this SLM for is since we can just carry it around the room and read sound level, uh, sound pressure levels, we, we can use it to do surveys. So, for instance, in this case, what's happening here is there is a 92 decibel source over here, a, a, a filling machine, it's a high speed uh, blender over here, 98 decibels, and so on and so forth. And what they've done is they have used this, this sound level meter, they've used this to uh, take a radius of three feet, six feet, and eight feet around, and they've, they've, they've measured how many decibels of sound, how, how much noise they measured each one of these areas. So if you're outside of this area, right, and people that work outside of this area are uh, exposed to less than permissible ocean permissible exposure. They don't have to have a, uh, uh, a hearing protection program. But if you're inside of that line, you have to have a hearing protection program. And you can take a look at how you get combinations of, in this case, what they're doing is, is that they're not, not necessarily they're, they're measuring, they're measuring and uh, where they look, where they have a 90 decibel sound level and then where they have an 84, an 85 decibel sound level. Eight decibel, so you can almost like a barometric chart. You can actually construct. Yeah. Are those radii uh, just one measurement, and then you? No, many you measurements. Have, you no, there are two lots. Yeah. At three, at three yeah, feet. Yeah. Exactly. It, exactly. You would have many of them. And in fact, really, in most sound, in most situations where you're doing a real sound survey, what you're doing is is that you might take you might take a three foot diameter. You might actually. Uh, take a sound level reading here and where it measures 90 decibels, make a little tick mark there. Then move over here where it measures 90 decibels, make a little tick mark here. 90 decibels, 90 decibels, 90 decibels, 90 decibels. And then connect them together. So it's kind of like you know from that point forward you're above 90 decibels. And similarly here they might do with 85 decibels, and they might do with 80 decibels, and so on. Okay, so in this case, he's, this is a sketch Brian made up. In this case, he's actually just, you know, measuring uh, uh, the air. He's measuring eight foot from that source, and he's measuring it in a couple of spots, and it's averaging about 85. But in a real sound level, these would not be nice concentric circles here. They might be way bigger and stuff like that, because you want to see the points at which you exceed a certain level. Okay, spot checking noise. Uh, 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 spot checking the levels of noise that were that are present, and also checking the levels. There's an inch of noise that are measured by a dosimeter. Infinity of his head. Basically, when you take sound level measurements, you're, you're considering a basically a two foot sphere around a person's head. So you would have an instrument or a, or a microphone that might be on his collar or on a device that he's wearing. Uh, uh, on his head or something like that. So you can take sound level measurements right in his hearing environment. Okay, so that dosimeter, that's what, that's what OSHA wants to know about. That's what's going to determine whether or not you have a, uh, uh, you require a hearing protection uh, program. 
Okay, so whenever you're talking about OSHA permissible exposure levels, you're always talking about specific measurements on the worker, right? So you're not talking about area measurements. So in that, in this case, you might use this as a uh, method to check that dosimeter to see if that dosimeter is reading properly. Okay, and we'll take a look at what the difference looks like from these two things. Uh, to check a worker's noise dose whenever a dosimeter is not available. Uh, so you can take maybe a quick reading to get an idea of, whether, uh, of uh, what, the, what the measurement is. Again, the only thing that OSHA is concerned about is eight hour time weighted exposure for determining whether there's a permissible exposure limit. So you could take a short term measurement to get a rough idea. And maybe you have a high level of confidence that it's always going to be below that level and you decide not to do individual monitoring. But if it's anywhere near close, the only thing counts is individual monitoring. Uh, to, to also for evaluating individual noise sources uh, to decide which ones you have to control. In other words, in the workers, in the work area, if this is making a lot of noise uh, and this one is tolerable, you might be able to uh, figure out ways to uh, move them around or locate them and so on and so forth uh, uh, to kind of engineer the area so that you don't have areas that exceed the uh, permissible exposure limit. Aid in engineering controls, feed and so on and so forth to decide which ones need enclosures and so on. So it's basically like a survey device for the most part. Yes. Oh, you got both. And dosimeter means anything that measures the dose that ex work is exposed to, right? So it could be a radiation dose, could be a noise dose, could be if there were, uh, in fact, they have carbon monoxide uh, uh, the, the, uh, devices where you can wear, if you work in the carbon monoxide environment, you can wear a badge that changes color, right, as you're exposed to carbon monoxide. So if you wear that over an eight hour period, you can, at the end of the day, hold it up against the chart and you can, you know, see what your dose was. If I, if I, if I have a, a device to measure uh, 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 carbon monoxide in my hand, a direct reading device, like an IAQ and or air quality monitor, and I can read on there an instantaneous reading what the, car, car, what the level of carbon monoxide is, that's not my dose. That's just the, le the current level, right? The dose is what you've been exposed to while you've been in that environment, right? So, it's, and it's time-weighted, right, over that period. Let me, uh, since we seem to be talking about this so much already, somebody stole my table. I did it take? What's that? Oh, it's back there. Okay. All right. Okay, so here's a sound level meter. Okay, this particular sound level meter can be programmed for A scale, uh, uh, C scale, and Z scale. It's currently programmed for A scale. You'll see it on here, it'll say LAS, L is for sound pressure level, and AS. And right now, as I'm talking, it's reading about 70 decibels, 70, 75 decibels. So if I want to start doing a survey in here, what's the first thing I have to do with this thing? Bingo, thank you very much. Okay, excellent. I have to calibrate the thing, okay? So we have devices for calibration. This basically is a little sound production device. If you read somewhere on it, right down here, it says that it produces uh, 114 decibels at 1,000 hertz. So when I turn this switch on, can you guys hear that from back there? Right? When I turn the switch on, you can actually hear this making noise. Okay, so that, now, I'm not measuring this out here. I actually have to put this in here. And I got the wrong one for this particular direction. Notice the hole is too small. They have inserts for them, right? So in other words, for a different device, for this device really should have a different insert. But I can, in the meantime, kind of hold it like this. What's it read? 108? Yeah, why is it not 114? Because I'm not, it's not enclosed. It's not, pro, you know, in other words, it would normally be completely enclosed. It would just barely slide in here. And it would actually read 114. This is this this instrument I know is calibrated. Right? So if I had the right sleeve for it, it would read 114. So now I know that this thing is will at a thousand hertz is reading properly. Okay, and so I could also now find the sound source. You know, next week I was gonna just hand this around. Next week I'll bring in the small speaker. So we can actually make some noise, okay? Um, um, one of the things I can do with a small speaker is I can generate uh, a, a sound that, that basically 
uh, is equal, it's an equal loudness, equal sound pressure levels in all of the frequencies, low frequencies and high frequencies. Anybody know what that kind of sound is? A lot of people use it to go to sleep at night. White noise, exactly. White noise means that uh, all across the bandwidth from 20 hertz up to 20,000 hertz, it's the same level of energy that it's producing. So that's white noise. How about pink noise? What do you think that might mean? All right, well, pink noise, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take a wild guess at this. Pink noise has more energy in a higher frequencies than has in a lower noise. You actually hear the difference, but at some point, maybe maybe next week when I have a little speaker here, I can put my iPhone on it and play the two different kinds of noise and measure. Let's say that I have white noise and I'm producing white noise. And I put this instrument on the A scale. That simulates the exposure to the human, but the effect, the health effect that you would have on the human for that for that type that type of sound. Okay, so we're on the A scale. If I use the Z scale, it measures all the frequencies equal. If, and so it's going to measure all of the frequencies in the white noise. If I put it on the A scale, it's going to attenuate the lowest uh, frequencies and a little bit on the highest frequencies also. Which one is going to read higher, the A scale or the C scale? What do you think? Right? Which one's measuring all the energy? The C scale. C scale's going to read a little bit higher, right? I'm not going to know. I'm not going to be able to measure, you know, what frequencies are going to be higher, but it's going to be measured a little bit higher because it's not going to attenuate those. It's going to measure everything together. The A scale is going to discount the lower frequencies and higher frequencies because our ears are not as sensitive to that. We're not when we're exposed to it, uh, we have fewer uh, receptors for that. So we don't have to be quite as concerned about that in terms of exposure. So I'm going to pass this around. You can talk into it, sing into it, you know, it's strangers in the night if you want or something like that. Give it a try. <laughs> Nobody sings strangers in the night. I don't remember the last time I heard that, so I'll tell you the truth. You don't hear much Frank anymore. Ever since he's been dead, he's forgotten. Actually, I hear, I hear Nancy Sinatra more often than I hear Frank Sinatra. Uh, excuse me? Uh, we're going to talk about that in a second. Type 1, Type 2, and Type 3. The most accurate of these instruments is a Type 1. They're super expensive. You'd only really use them in laboratories. So, for instance, for uh, calibrating, uh, for calibrating other instrumentation, for testing uh, sound protection devices, and so on and so forth, for uh, 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 for determining what the noise reduction rating is on a product like uh, earmuffs or something like that, you would use them in a laboratory. Type two are are uh, a more general use, right? They're they're uh, uh, very accurate. They're pretty expensive, but you might use them for uh, field measurements and so on and so forth. And type three is the least, least expensive of those. And you know, I'll tell you what, for next week, I'll, I'll send out an announcement. Why don't you guys want to download a sound level measuring uh, app on your phones, right? <laughs> so that way we can kind of all kind of take some readings, see how well these things work. If you can find one that's both sound level measurement and dosimeter, that would be great. If not, don't worry. Don't spend money on it. Just find whatever it seems to be the most popular free version for your phone. What's that? Yeah, NIOSH has one, right? Yeah, yeah, man. yeah. Give that a try. Somebody give that a try. Yes. Uh, oh, zero, one, two. I thought it was one, two, three. Let's see. I'm frozen. Yeah, slide says zero. Type one, type two. Yes, yeah, said type zero, type one, type two. Yep. You're right. Senior moment. Cost of performance vary with time, of course. Okay. So, okay. So basically, you're looking. Uh, uh, the difference is really the accuracy of the three of the various devices. Survey grade type two is the cheap, is the least expensive. Uh, engineering grade type one, uh, uh, and you'd see them in the field quite a bit. Uh, type zero, you'd almost never see in the field. Uh, I would guess that's probably. Let me see that thing over there. Probably guessing. Based on what it's cost, I would say it's probably a type one, I think, plus or minus one decibel. If somebody goes online, they can look up the specs for it and just look up uh, uh, what the uh, 
with the accuracy, it's plus or minus. Uh, it's a type two. Yeah, it's on there. What's that? It's a type two. Does it say on there? Yeah. Okay. So it's plus or minus two decibels. But that's basically how you would know which one it is. Cost, uh, accuracy, cost, and uh, which is, uh, and, and uh, the accuracy is a lot of it is determined by the quality of the microphone. Okay. Type one versus type two. What do we got in price there? 1300 versus. Type, type one is 3000 and that's 1300. I think the price is much cheaper nowadays than they were then. Okay, uh, so how do we use this thing? First, uh, uh, first you position the microphone uh, in the worker's hearing zone. If you wanna make a quick measurement, a short term measurement in the worker's hearing zone, again, that's like two foot circle diameter around his head. Um, uh, 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 you, uh, yeah, and then you measure, uh, you, hold, you want to hold it one meter, you want to hold it out, you don't want to hold it close to your body because your body is going to be attenuating some of the noise that might uh, be produced. And you want to use a windscreen because you don't want to get uh, uh, measure short term uh, change. Remember, remember the wind, the pressure of the wind, right, is much greater than that little bit of pressure from the sound, so it can really impact the reading that you get. So literally, that is much greater than uh, uh, what my voice, my voice doesn't produce that same effect on there. Okay, so to, uh, slow response. Again, uh, you're, you're in the millisecond range for fast response. Uh, you're in the second range for uh, slow response. And typically, we'd be taking readings uh, 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 at slow response. Now, dosimeters. This is the decimeter. has a little clock in it as well as uh, being a sound level uh, measurement device. And it will give you sound level measurements. Okay. No, because that, they don't have that. You can program them to store. Some of them have memory in them. You can program them to store data, uh, which you can download to. Uh, many of them have programs you can connect to them. You can download the data, maybe take a reading every minute. And from that, when you download it, either you can do it on your own, like with Excel, or you can use a program that it comes with to calculate the dose that they were exposed to. Okay. But they themselves will not display it. Now, a dosimeter actually has everything. It's a little computer in there. It has everything you need, not just take a sound level, short-term sound level measurement, but also to calculate the, the dose, the percentage of the permissible exposure limit that you, were ex that you were exposed to. Now, given this instrument has a lot of different settings on it, um, uh, it's, uh, I have it set up so it's reading uh, right now, 71, but I read about the same thing, about 70 decibels, as we saw before. And I hold them, one of the things we might want to do is hold these two together, the sound level meter and this, together, just to do kind of a quick bump check on this thing. Uh, so, what are the settings that I want to put this on if I'm going to do work or exposures? First of all, what's the first thing I want to do? What's that? Yeah, make sure the batteries will, how about cal calibrate again, right? So calibrate is the first thing we want to do. Second, make sure the battery's full. How about the third thing? What setting? Okay, we want to tell it, we want to program it. So if we're not there, we might have it just reading continuously. If we're going to be on the job site, it's going to wear it for full eight hours. And we can talk about later on what the, the, the idea of whether you should wear it during breaks and stuff like that and so on. Okay, most people leave, leave on during breaks because uh, just pra more practical. Um, uh, but what are the variables here? When we measure sound, we have a couple of things we have to be concerned about, right? In terms of like what we're measuring. Okay, so if we're taking measurements of the human exposure, what setting do we have to have on here? A scale. A -scale. We want to make sure it's on the A scale, right? Probably want a slow response. And there is another thing in here, and that is, is that OSHA has really two standards for exposure to noise. It has its permissible exposure limit. Right? 
It also has another version that's called a hearing conservation standard. Remember what we talked about, about the OSHA permissible exposure limit? What's the problem with that exposure limit? It's one of those exposure limits that are not protective. If you're exposed at that permissible exposure limit, after 20 years of exposure, you're going to have significant hearing loss, right? So it's not a protective standard. So work uh, employers have the option or unions have the option of enforcing a more rigid standard, right? So you have a hearing conservation standard for OSHA. Who else has a standard for noise exposure? NIOSH, right? NIOSH has a recommended exposure limit, right? And they have their own method of calculating, right? And, uh, and how about anybody else? I think ACGIH has one also, but I don't think anybody actually uses it. Right? And I think it's pretty much the same as the NIOSH standard. So let's pass this around. Yes? I'm sorry, ANSI? I, you know, that's, that's probably the same as the NIOSH, but that'd be my guess. But I, my guess is they probably would have something, you know. But again, the, the, the big ones that are used are the uh, OSHA permissible exposure limit and the NIOSH recommended exposure limit. And it's also going to impact how we do calculations in terms of uh, if we don't have a dosimeter, if we're measuring sound levels differently, how we're going to determine what the exposure is. So if we, got, if we have to do it kind of manually. You guys want to pass this around? Hold them side by side. Read them first and then talk. <clears throat> so? <laughs> Are they close? So, okay, it's pretty close. They went a couple of decibels of each other, right? Which makes sense. What did we say the accuracy was on that type two meter? Plus or minus two. two decibels. Two decibels is a lot of sound, right? Remember, it's a logarithmic scale. So two decibels is a, is a pretty significant difference. That's why the laboratory grade one, uh, uh, which is much more accurate, is used for a lot of uh, uh, important kinds of calibrations and measurements. Okay. But, uh, but other instruments, I'm sorry, say again. Yeah. Yeah, it bumped it bumped up. That's why that's why you'll notice on the dosimeter it has a windshield on it, right? And you should probably have the windshield on the sound level that you can try close to it. Uh yeah, pretty much. I mean if you're if you're indoors and there's no air movement, stuff like that, and you're alone, there's not a lot of, out of activity, you wouldn't bother with it probably, but if you're outdoors, or if you're in an environment where there's a lot of motion and activity that generates air currents and stuff like that, you would put like that, yeah, this on. Who's got it right now? Well, you're supposed to catch it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so yeah, put the windshield on it as, a, as a, you're working with it. And if you want, you can pass this around. Okay, and don't stick this in your ear when you turn it on. Do me a favor. Don't laugh. It happens. Get it away from me. It's annoying. <laughs> yes. That's, you can't change the volume, right? Because the volume is, you know, a, a, a standard. Yes. I, I would say if you're doing if you're doing field measurements or if you're doing work or exposure, you want to calibrate it every before and after you use it. Every time you use it, basically. Okay. So dosimeters typically work yeah, for per permissible exposure limit. You're typically working for an a typical eight-hour work shape, workplace exposure. Okay. Um, you want to record other environmental. Characteristics, your temperature, humidity, and so on and so forth, need to be pre and post calibrated, as I said before and after you use it. Okay. Okay. So uh, uh, the dosimeter is the primary instrument for making compliance measurements. Why is it the primary? I, I mentioned this already, but I want to emphasize it. Why is the dosimeter the primary uh, uh, measure, uh, uh, compliance device for OSHA? As opposed to the sound level meter. Why is that one the uh, the primary instrument? It's attached to the worker. It's me measuring his exposure during that entire period of time that he's working. The other device is just taking short-term readings. 
Okay, so that's why it's primary. Okay, uh, OSHA criteria and the way that this, if this is set up for the OSHA PEL, it has a five decibel exchange rate. We're gonna get into a chart in a second where uh, it discusses the, uh, 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 the uh, level of sound, sound exposure and this thing called exchange rate. So if you are exposed to noise at work that's over 85 decibels, what happens? What do we apply? We have a hearing conservation standard. What does that mean? What do, you, what do you do when you have a hearing conservation standard? We spoke about this briefly, I think, last week. Right? What does that mean? So now you're exposed to too much work, more than the OSHA standard, which is 85. Does it mean that you have to start wearing earplugs and, and earmuffs and so on and so forth at 85, at 86 decibels? No, because the permissible exposure limit to eight-hour time weighted is 90 decibels. 85 is where the standard kicks in. At that point, you have to you know, evaluate the worker's environment, decide whether you can control it below that, uh, and among other things, you have to provide education and you have to, uh, you have to monitor the worker's hearing during, during the course of his career. With, uh, during the course of his work. Okay, so those standards start to kick in. The actual exposure limit for OSHA is 90. For NIOSH, it's 85. For, for OSHA, it's 90. Okay, so now that means you can be exposed for how long in a workday at 90 decibels? Right? What is your OSHA standard always? Eight hours, right? So you can be exposed to 90 decibels for eight hours. Well, now, what if you're exposed to 95 decibels? What happens then? Can you be exposed for not for uh, eight hours? No, you can't, right? Because you're uh, you're only be exposed to ninety decibel for eight hours. OSHA uses an exchange rate of five decibels. That means for every five decibels you go up above ninety decibels, you can only be exposed for half of that time. So you can be exposed at ninety-five decibels for four hours. How about hundred decibels? Two hours. How about 105 decibels? One hour. How about 110 decibels? Right, half an hour. So five every five decibels uh, uh, cuts the exposure time in half. Okay, so that's a five decibel exposure limit. Does NIOSH use a five decibel exposure limit? Well, we're going to find out. We're going to come across uh, OSHA pretty soon. And the re type of reading you're going to take is a slow measurement. And at 85 decibels, you have the Hearing conservation program or 90 decibels, you actually uh, start to put in administrative and engineering controls. Administrative controls means you, we're going to talk about that. We got a pyramid that we're going to come across in a second. I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay. Okay, so what are the issues with dosimeters? Well, one of the things that you can have a problem with is, is uh, 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 when they say contamination, they mean short, very short duration noises that are very intense. So for instance, if uh, 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 every once in a while there's like a very loud bang or something like that, it can make it more difficult to figure out what the level that you're continuously exposed to. Right? Um, uh, 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 the other problem is, is that if you start monkeying, if you start the sampling before you actually put it on the worker, Right? You, can, you can throw the readings off because you're manipulating the thing and so on and so forth. So you want to start the sampling after you place the mic on the worker. Um, uh, uh, and, and you also want to make sure occasionally that it's actually reading correctly by taking sound level measurements and making sure that they work to get, that they're, they're agreeing with your, uh, your uh, dosimeter. Like we just did here. We compared the sound level meter with the dosimeter to see if they were reading similarly. Now, octave band analyzer. Let's see if I can't have a, if I have a, yeah. okay. So, in some situations, this is not necessarily uh, 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 in measuring, most measurements where we're taking, where we're trying to comply with the OSHA standard. In some situations, uh, we may have devices that produce noise that's predominantly in certain frequencies, right? And we may be able to use special devices to protect the worker uh, from those frequencies that are better at filtering those frequencies out. Or uh, we may be able to alter the instrument or enclose the instrument to do, find some way to, to attenuate those particular frequencies. But in order to do that, we have to know 
what those frequencies are, right? So there are versions of those sound level meters like this that are also active band analyzed, uh, octave band analyzed. What's an octave? Anybody on the piano, what's an octave? Anybody know what the frequency of middle C is? Huh? I think it's some, and some of you must play the piano, right? I think it's 800, what is it, 440, 880? Huh? That's A? Say, I knew somebody would know. What is C? You know? Okay, we'll do, we use A. That's middle A is, is what? 440? Okay. What's, uh, what's the next octave up? What's the frequency of the next octave up? It's easy. Uh, double it. It's 880. What's the uh, next day? Right? 1720, 1760, right? So an octave actually doubles the frequency. And it's broken up in how many steps? Octave. Eight steps, with like keys in between, half steps as well, the keys in between. So when you play a piano and you hit, you, you hit low C and you hit high C, they resonate, right? Because one is double the frequency of the other. So they line up every other way it lines up. So, so uh, and you can hear that, right? That when you tune, like when people tune stuff, right? They're, they're looking for that quiver, right? They want to get rid of that quiver when the two, two notes are just a little bit different so that uh, they actually resonate. So, so let me bring in the guitar next week so we can actually see how, how that works. We'll take the, if we have combined an active band analyzer, we'll give it a try. So now you know that uh, uh, middle A is 440. Each octave is double the free, is arranged and starts at a certain frequency and is up to double that frequency. So if you look at this, here are a series of octaves from 22 to 44 hertz, right? That's one octave from 44 to 88 hertz, okay? And the number that's in the middle there is kind of a weighted average of the energy that's in, the, that's in that whole octave. So there's a little bit more energy in the higher frequencies and the lower frequencies. So it actually kind of leans up. It's not right in the middle, it leans up a little bit. So when you look at an octave band analyzer, you may not see 22 to 44 hertz as the, as one, as the lowest band, right, in the uh, lowest octave. What you'll see is the midpoint, 31.5. And the next one is 63, but it's really a range around 63. Next one's 125. So we can take an octave band analyzer and we can tell it to measure the sound pressure for only the band that's around 125 hertz. And then only the band that's 250 hertz. And only the band that's around 500 hertz. So we can measure how much energy there is at each one of these octaves. Okay, as we go up, and and uh, if we in certain situations, uh, uh, if it's white noise, what are we going to find about the energy in each one of these octaves? It's going to be flat. It's going to be flat. Okay, and, but if it's a normal noise where you know you have a machine that whines or something like that, very high frequency, you can almost you almost know right away that that the highest energy levels are going to be at the highest frequency, not at the lower lower frequency. And you can actually have some of them that you can actually show graphically what the octave, what the, uh, 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 where the energy is in that noise that's being produced. We, when we had an octave band analyzer before, I would set up a speaker, generate white noise from the speaker, and we would set up the octave band analyzer to, to measure it. And it would work pretty good from, it was pretty good at measuring almost exactly the same level at, say, from, 125, de 125 decibels band center up to about maybe 8,000 uh, uh, band center. And then, you know, it was close, but it wasn't really the same, even though it was a white noise at either end. Anybody got any idea why? Right? I mean, the, the program in here generated a perfect white noise. What's the problem? Why wasn't I, and the instrument was working, right? Why wasn't I reading exactly the same energy in every, in every band, especially not the, the, the furthest ones in the center? Anyone want to guess? How many of you guys bought, have ever bought a high-end speaker? Right. You get a chart with that high-end speaker? It's got a graph. It's kind of like a graph, and it has like this thing that looks like a, something like that. It, kind of, it goes flat, and then there's a little bend at the beginning and at the end. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> What you're getting with that speaker is a, you're getting a demonstration of what the accuracy response of that speaker is. 
Now, back in the days when you used to go to Lafayette Radio and Harmon Corden on 47th Street, whatever, all these high-end speaker makers, you would get a chart like that. And the chart would tell you if you put in exactly the right amount of energy, you know, exactly uh, the amount, same amount of energy into all this and the real white noise, you put it, put it in that speaker, this is what you would get out of the speaker. None of them were ever flat lines. The closer to a flat line, the better the reproduction of sound is. But they never do. So even if I put a speaker in here with white noise on it, right, it would be predominantly white noise, but really at the far ends, right, that speaker would have to perform, would be capable of delivering exactly, uh, recreating that exact white noise. So it's almost perfect white noise, but not quite, because, because this is okay. The program can produce it, but the speaker can't deliver that way. Right? And we could test, use an octave band analyzer to check how good a speaker is at producing the exact sound that we want out of this thing. Well, why would you be interested in that speaker? Right? What do you want that speaker to do? If you have uh, uh, Isaac Perlman playing the violin, right? You want to hear, you want that speaker to spit out exactly the same sound that you would hear if he was standing in front of you. Is it capable of doing that? Almost, right? A speaker that has a very perfect flat line would literally do that. Right? It would reproduce the sound that went in exactly the same way. But it's really in reality speaking, you know, like very high end ones do it pretty well, but none of them do it perfectly. So that's one, one of the reasons you might, might be interested in a laboratory of, of, uh, of uh, being able to take active, active band readings is active band reading is to see how efficient a speaker is, how sound production devices respond, and so on and so forth. Occupationally, we might be interested in it because it might impact what kind of hearing protection devices we use and what kind of control devices, control methods we might use to uh, reduce the sound exposure. Right? So occasionally, you might be able to use it. New York City, 20 or 30 years ago, if you called up the Department of Health made a noise complaint, I used to live on 91st Street, 2nd Avenue, across from Rook, Rupert, Knickerbocker Towers, like in a tenement building. This is going back into like the late 70s, early 80s. And there was a bar on the first floor called Home. Anybody know the place? It's not. Okay. The bar, it was very, it was a famous bar. It was like, you know, it was like Lennon, John Lennon had like an, owned an interest in it or something like that. But at any rate, it was a bar. So they would have music all the time. And, you know, I was, I was young enough that, you know, it didn't bother me, but there were people, people who complain if they played late and stuff like that. So what would you do? If you didn't like it, you'd call up the uh, New York City Department of Health, make a noise complaint, they would send someone down. That person would go to your apartment with an octave band analyzer. The, the law at that time had different, in other words, because uh, you guys know that uh, you, any time you've been on the highway and somebody's pulled up to you and they're and they have been radio set real loud, but you got your windows up, they got their windows up also. You hear the sound, but you don't really hear the words, all right? What do you, what do you hear? What part of the octave band do you, what part of the sound do you hear? The high frequencies or low frequencies? You hear the low frequencies, right? You feel the vibration, you hear the low frequencies and stuff, it carries, right? So the theory was that they would measure all these different frequencies to decide whether at uh, what point it's annoying enough that you have a case, right? So they would actually send, the guy would have to go up to your apartment in the middle of the night or one in the morning when, when I don't know, some, 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 some uh, punk group was playing at home and uh, measure at your window, take measurements of an octave band analyze, record it all and so on and so forth. It became so common, then they have to go to court with all the paperwork and the documents and so on and so forth and try to explain to the judge what an octave band analyzer was. So that's, you know, you can imagine what that was like. So uh, eventually I've given them up. So how does the New York City Department have respond to noise complaints now? Anybody know? Well, that too, yeah. yeah they, do. they start with that. If the complaints continue, they actually send somebody up there. But how do they measure it? How do they measure it? Well, now, according to their, their health code, they go up there, the guy opens the window. If it sounds too loud, he says that's a, he says it's a valid complaint. And they make a judgment. Why? Because it's so cumbersome to do these measurements. And then in court, it's very difficult to demonstrate what they mean and stuff like that. So, but I mean, there's reasons why we might be interested in, in that and so on and so forth. Now, sampling during breaks, for the most part, I think most 
people leave the thing in place during breaks, you have to make a judgment because if the break area is, is noisier than the work area, if the eight hour period is included in the work day, in other words, a guy really works seven hours and he has an hour for lunch, you might want to consider you know, taking that reading. But if he works eight hours and he has an eight hour break, well, in that case, you know, you don't want to include because you only want eight hour exposure, right? So uh, you have to make a, a, a judgment. <clears throat> okay, uh, and like for instance, if you do take a break, in other words, you take more readings in the morning, right? Take a break, what are you gonna do? You're gonna recalibrate it before and after. In other words, you put it back on the guy later, you're gonna, you're gonna calibrate it before you do it. Okay, but on a practical basis, if it's not a ridiculously noisy environment, and it's part of his eight-hour workday. His half-hour lunch break or coffee breaks, part of his eight-hour work break, I probably would leave it on. Because again, exposure, we're interested in what the exposure is over the eight hours that he's actually working. Okay, so, so we know the relationship between uh, excessive noise and, uh, and, and uh, hearing loss. Right, and but now we want to know how are we going to protect the worker? He has a excessive exposure to noise, and how are we going to protect them? Well, there's there's a whole series of uh, 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 methods that we can use that we can implement to uh, uh, just like any other kind of occupational exposure to control exposure to a hazard in the workplace. Okay, so why implement them? Well, number one, it's required by OSHA. Right? It's in the Federal Register. It's part of the Federal Register. There's a standard for it. Uh, reduce compensation costs. Now, this is kind of, you know, uh, this is an occupational illness. A lot of people don't realize that they've had the hearing loss until after they've left the job, like years later, and so on and so forth. So, a very difficult case for them to make. It doesn't show up so much, and OSHA records are probably ridiculously un underreported. So, and, or, you know, that, now people, because it causes stress, a lot of loud noise causes stress, you do get some absenteeism and injuries. You can't communicate, uh, it's distracting, so uh, it contributes to injuries as well. So how are we gonna control this stuff, right? Okay, so uh, you, uh, a lot of times we just see uh, three elements here, right? We see uh, uh, engineering, right? In this case, engineering is broken down into three, uh, engineering, administrative controls, and protective equipment. Usually the hierarchy we usually talk about. In this case, we're looking at engineering broken down into three categories. Number one, eliminate the sound, eliminate the noise. Get rid of that device that's causing the problem. Uh, 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 number two, substitute. Is there a machine that is less likely to cause noise? It causes less noise, does the same job, causes less noise, uh, and so on and so forth. Number three, engineering controls, right? In other words, you can't replace the machine. That's the only one you can use. You can't reduce the noise on the machine in order for it to work properly, well, maybe you can put it into an enclosure, right? So is, um, is, is putting the machine into an enclosure the only way to protect the worker in that manner? I mean, what else could you do rather than to put the machine in an enclosure that involves using an enclosure? What's that? Yeah, put it on springs by break. Yeah, exactly, put it on springs, you could do that. That's an engineering control. But I'm thinking about, I'm still gonna use an enclosure. Right. Put the worker in enclosure, right? You guys ever been in a big power plant? Big power plant, you got all these generators and turbines and everything else that's enormously noisy. And where are the workers 90% of the time? They're monitoring it in a control room, in an insulated control room. So you can put the device in the, the noise source in, the, in, in an enclosure, or you can put the worker in an enclosure and protect them as well. So that's a control also. In fact, it's, that's done more often than you would think. Okay, what about administrative controls? What do they mean, administrative controls? Training, yeah, exactly, training, what else? Yeah, pol what kind of policy? In other words, there's a machine makes a lot of noise, but what kind of policy would protect the worker, yeah? Yeah, force breaks or change. In other words, he only works in that area for a short period of time. In other words, he trades jobs with someone else and nobody is exposed for, you minimize the exposure for each worker you know, by uh, uh, giving them other tasks that don't involve noise, right? So that's another way, yeah, that's another way you could uh, uh, use an administrative control, work rules, and so on and so forth. So, and then you get to what's the last, what's the last line of protection? PPE, right. If you're an industrial hygienist and you're using PPE, what's happened? You failed, 
That's my that my personal attitude. You got to make a guy wear something to protect him. You failed, right? right? Because why have you failed, right? Which is the least reliable of all these things? Putting an enclosure, you know, um, making him take breaks and so on. So, which is the least reliable thing in this in this in this uh, in this uh, hierarchy? The war you got a PPE because number one, it's got to fit right, it's got to work right, and most of all, what? He's got to wear the damn stuff, right? So that's the weakest point of this whole thing. You can make all sorts of rules and stuff like that. You can enforce the rules, make sure they follow them, and so on and so forth. You can put in engineering, you can do substitution, so, so on and so forth. But once you go to PPE, you, you, uh, 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 you're dependent on the worker to really comply, and you're dependent on the equipment to really protect them. And we're going to talk about like how, how we measure how effective these protective devices are protecting the workers and um, uh, one thing, and applying something called noise reduction uh, rating, NRR noise reduction rating, in a second. Okay, but that's the word that, you know, you, you get the personal protective equipment, it, it, it's just, it's difficult at that point. Now, I know if you're in Chernobyl and you're cleaning up radioactive waste, there's no getting around personal protective equipment, right? But yeah, anytime you can engineering, uh, engineer it out or, or manage it out, manage out the hazard. That's that's a much better way to approach it. Okay, noise controls. Uh, you have to have controls when the subject of sound is exceeding 90 decibels uh, for a time-weighted eight-hour period. Uh, uh, if they fail to reduce the sound levels below 90 decibels, hearing protection must be provided and used to reduce the sound level below the PEL. So, you, you need to get the worker's exposure down below the PEL. What the, uh, if, uh, and if it takes personal protective equipment, you need to use it. Um, I'm not, okay, and okay, shift. And let's see, here's a kind of quick diagram. You know, I had a, I've been having access problems on Blackboard. Uh, by tomorrow morning, I should be able to post again. So I'll get this PowerPoint posted on Blackboard. I know you don't have access to it right now, but I'll make sure that it's posted by tomorrow morning. Okay, uh, so what are we doing here? We have enclosures, and enclosures different kinds of materials or vibration dampers and so on and so forth. Uh, 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 different kinds of materials and sub substitution. Uh, we can retrofit products and applications by uh, vibration dampening. And uh, uh, I used to have friends that were in a rock band back in the late 60s, early 70s. I loosely call it a rock band. They made a lot of noise, but. I don't know how much rock they did. But at any rate, uh, they would do their own recording. They had little, back in those days, you reel, reel to reel tape recorders and big and microphones and, and so on and so forth. And they had a room that they had set up and they would record in that, they would do their own recordings in that room. So what did they need? They, they, they didn't need a lot of echo and stuff. They want echo and stuff like that. They want to just produce the sound, get the sound recorded that we were producing. They don't want a lot of reverberation and echo and so on and so forth. So what's the cheapest sound dampening material that you can think of that you can go out and buy? Egg crates. Yeah, they had egg crates stapled up all the day. They went to the supermarket. They went to restaurants, collected egg crates, and they stapled them all up. So yeah, they used egg crates all over the roof, the ceiling, the walls, and so on and so forth. And then they found carpeting on the street for the floor. So... People don't do that anymore. They're afraid of bed bugs now. So anything or get anything like that's cloth. Nobody takes. I, I tried to throw out a couple of pillows and the and the sanitation refused, refused to take them. I put them in a plastic bag. They didn't take them. They won't touch them. And they were clean. It wasn't like they looked nasty or anything like that. Okay. So uh, relocation of sources, rather of pneumatic or compressed air, discharge force from the outside of the machine cabinets. Uh, to the uh, to the inside of machine cabinets rather than insides. So in other words, you got to clean a part, you put it inside an enclosure, you bring the high pressure uh, air nozzle inside, and you use it in there so you can capture the. Uh... So where do you guys expose the high noise from high pressure nozzles? You guys ever expose the noise from high pressure nozzles really loud? To I bet you you get up about 100 decibels, maybe even higher. And I guarantee you, in the past month, you've been exposed to this. Maybe, what's, what's that? Maybe not a car wash, but you got the right direction. How about those hand washing, those hand blowers? 
Right? You push that button, how loud are they? Right? They're pretty loud. Right? They're pretty loud. And there's a lot of arguments. That, that's pretty loud. Now, now I tell you what. Do we have any in the school here? I don't think so. It's all paper towels in the school. Here, right? Too bad. Okay. I was going to say next week if we have equipment available, maybe we can actually mention that. Or if when any of you guys wind up in the lab next semester, uh, uh, maybe you could do a survey of those machines and so on. There's a lot of issues with them, you know, in terms of whether or not if the idea there is you don't use the paper towels, you save the, the resource of paper towels, and also you're not touching anything. So it's, uh, it's uh, more sad. It's, uh, it's more uh, it's, yeah, more sanitary, I guess. But you can also argue that it's blowing. You know, stuff off your hands, particularly off your hands. So maybe they're not more sanitary. Right? So who knows? Yeah, I'm sure the manufacturer doesn't want to know, so he's not doing any testing. Okay. So let's let's talk about what happens when you are exposed. Let's see what measure we can use. Okay. Uh, this is a graph that shows the level of noise that's produced by a machine that's operated at different speeds. So there's an engineering solution. If you have a, if you have a drill that you operate, if you operate it at uh, 3,000 RPM or something like that, it makes an enormous amount of noise. Uh, if it'll do the job at 2,000, if it'll, if, if it'll adequately do the job you need it for at 1,500 RPM and reduce as much noise, there's a, a typical uh, engineering control that you might use. Okay, substitute for the source. If you're using belts over gears, you know, writing from gears. So belts are acquired, they're flexible material. They're acquired using belt conveyors instead of rollers. You've seen the metal rollers that so a lot of times you'll see them, you know, in supermarkets and stuff like that. And they can make quite a bit in a, in a, uh, in a manufacturing facility, they're using the roll product around and stuff like that. And they make a lot of noise. So if they have a belt on, it's much quieter. Substituting metal or steel parts with materials that have high dampening properties such as wood, nylon, stiff plastic, and so on. Uh, using perforator mesh panels instead of solid panels to help dampen sound. Okay, some substitution examples. Um, now, uh, uh, when you have, when you, when, if you've taken any indoor air quality courses or industrial ventilation, if you get into those courses, one of the issues is gonna be noise. Noise generated by hoods, by exhaust hoods, by industrial ventilation systems, by air conditioning systems. Let me think, have I ever been in a situation where there was excessive noise from an air conditioning system that's been disturbing? Well, there, that's a design problem. Why is that so noisy? Why, why, was, it, why was there that noise? What's happening up there that made that so, that made that so noisy? The velocity is too high. Right, you know what? These diffusers that you, we don't have in this room. See the, these diffusers on the side here? They're taking the place of sealing diffusers. Sealing diffusers, the air comes down, and you'll notice that there are little little curved vents in them. Comes down, so instead of going straight down and hitting you in the head, you kind of like they diffuse the air. They turn and curl, and the air mixes and so on and so forth. For most of them, you'll only, you only have a, maybe each one only have a couple hundred CFM cubic feet per minute coming out of them. This one over here, it seems like a couple of those are not working, right? Or they're blocked or, or turned off. And these two up front here are taking all of that air that would go through these ones in the back and they're blowing it in here. They're blowing it in here very fast, perhaps a lot faster than it's necessary. And back there, there's dampers that they can use to control the flow of air that's going through this ductwork, right? Now, it could be somebody left them wide open it could be that they're that they're motorized dampers or pneumatic dampers and the controls and they're connected to the thermostat back there and the controls that's called a variable air volume system and those controls should control how open those dampers are so if the room gets warm and we do more cold air they open a little more but not wide open right so it could be the controls are bad could be the dampers are jammed could be a number of reasons but the reason for the noise was the velocity was too great same thing with an industrial ventilation system. The, the, the velocity has to be high enough that you want to capture the contaminant, keep it suspended in the air so you can get it out of the building. So if you're, if you're dealing with a gas or vapor, right, well, that's not going to fall out inside the ductwork. So you can have a nice slow flow through the ductwork. If you're dealing with fine dust 
Well, now you got the air's got to move a little bit faster, otherwise the dust is going to settle outside the exhaust duct, right? The, the capture duct. So you need to get a little faster. If you're if you're dealing with grinders that are spitting out large particles, you really have to keep the air moving really fast, keep that stuff suspended so you can get it out of the space, right? So. But, but the deal there is, is that as you increase that velocity, there's more friction inside the ductwork, and you're going to generate more noise. Not only that, but when it gets to the end, when it comes out of the device, it's got to go across the room to that other side. If you have a dead end up there in a right angle, 90 degree right angle, that air is going to blow up there, hit that ductwork, blow across, and make a lot of noise as it creates friction up there, right? Noise and heat, you gener generate noise and heat as it hits that. If you had a general, a, 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 a gentle slope, gentle curve, the bigger the radius of the curve is, the less noise you're going to generate. So you can, you can uh, substitute, you see it here, you can substitute, you can, uh, you can modify the design of these air handling systems so that uh, you can control how much noise they generate. Bad job here. I think it, it's got to be a control issue here, uh, not, not, not a design issue. I would think they would have anticipated that noise. And it's not doing it now. Maybe they fixed it. So, okay. So here's some examples of modifying the process, the industrial process. So instead of uh, uh, dumping uh, uh, material directly into the middle of a hopper, it runs down the side of the hopper instead. Okay. And, uh, and they, so in here, they substituted a mesh uh, 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 belt guard for a solid one. So that helps uh, uh, attenuate the noise a bit as well. Relocation, you know, move the equipment uh, uh, further apart or, uh, or into areas where you, you can control it even better. Okay, we remember this formula. Okay, noise pathway. Okay, there's an enclosure. And let me see what else we have that's interesting here. Uh, various kinds of like uh, materials for dampening sound. Ceiling tiles, baffles. Yeah, there you go. Okay, administrative controls. Da, da, da. <coughs> Rotating workers. We we discussed a lot of this stuff. This this is this just came back. It's a repeat. Okay, hearing protection devices. Last option. Right? It's, we failed. Haven't managed to control it. So now we found that we have to provide the worker with a hearing protection device. Uh, now, if you if you have a hearing conservation uh, program because you're above 85 decibels, you need to you need to provide the, that protection at no cost to the employee, and you got to replace it as it wears out or as necessary. Okay, types: earplugs, earmuffs, ear caps. Okay, earplugs are remarkably good at reducing the amount of sound that gets into the ear. But you got to make sure you have it installed correctly. It's got to be, you know, compress it properly, get it into your ear, way into your ear canal, uh, and have it expand so it really blocks out the noise. They're remarkably effective at reducing noise exposure. A little bit hard to measure. There's no techniques that can use it. Earmuffs are also very good. But what's the problem with earmuffs? Why would I have a problem wearing earmuffs and having them work effectively? Me personally. Glasses, right? If the earmuffs on, there's a connect, there's a route for the sound to get. They don't seal up quite as well. How about people with like, you know, large sideburns or something like that, or facial hair? Same problem. I'm in a business that doesn't like facial hair. What can I tell you about that? Too bad, right? Okay, so now let's take a look at a couple of these things. I brought a couple. Okay. So in this, in this case, the earmuffs happen to be connected to this. Hard hat, pump hat, and I want to find the number so you can. Okay, there you go. See if you can't find a number on there, a model number. They buried in the model number. You would think they put a label on there, but they buried in the model number. I think if you look, it's on the outside, I think. Try the outside. All right, somewhere on there, there's a model number. Try on the earmuffs themselves. But rather than the hard hat, try the earmuffs. Yeah. Yeah, that's just, that's just a standard. But if you look on the outside of the earmuffs, on the somewhere on there. 
26. Okay, what do you think that 26 is? That 26 is a noise reduction rating, right? Now, the paperwork that it came with probably had a lot more information on it, but they put it, they buried it in the model. That's a noise reduction rating. That means that that device is designed to, to uh, uh, attenuate the noise so it reduces it by 26 decibels. Does it really reduce it by 26 decibels? No, it doesn't. Does It's not perfect, right? There's fit issues, there's uh, uh, use issues. Uh, it's not, it's not going to be used in a perfect environment. We discount that in a certain way to make sure that we, we, we assume a noise reduction rating for that thing that it really can achieve. Okay. Same thing with these uh, with earplugs. And here, here we have I think I got enough for everybody. I just want to deal with these. Yeah, bad, bad memory disease. <laughs> you know, I had a guy, I used to have in my office, I had a box of these things. <laughs> yeah. By the way, I don't want a battery. <laughs> if, there's, if there's any leftovers, I don't want that battery. Um, I did notice. I did come across a, a, a conference. I came across an outfit that was taking, it was creating earplugs, and what they were doing was they would they would literally, you know, take you to a, a, a clinic where they would clean out your ear, you know, shave, you know, like go in and like clean all the wax out and take all the hairs out. So when you, if you ever get hearing aids, that's what they do. They clean out your ear completely, take all the wax out, clean all the hairs, everything. Just want bare skin. And, and they fit the earplugs, the, the hearing aid, to your ear. It's designed to fit specifically in your ear. That's why they cost three grand or a pair, a, a pair of hearing aids, typically five grand and up, right? And they're not covered by Medicare or, or most insurance. Very expensive. Apple, Google, a whole bunch of other companies are starting to get into that market because they're, they're, they're dealing with a hearing device, you know, like uh, speakers and hearing devices that go into your ear. There's getting into that, that thing, getting into that market. And so you're starting to see uh, 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 just the tip of the iceberg in terms of uh, uh, large scale manufacturer hearing aid devices. Also, the population's aging. There's a market for this stuff. And they're getting, starting to get into this market or getting, uh, testing the market for this kind of stuff. And you're getting into, you're getting into things that have just as good performance at $500 or $1,000 or something like that. Difference is, is that for the most part they're kind of general fit they're not specifically fitted to the individual so they may not fit as well you may have you may have to do your own judgment on, on how they fit they may have to come with multiple different you know housings or something like that just like little you know your ear pods a lot of times come with that. Uh, but they're getting into this market so they would literally uh, uh, yeah, it, uh, in the, in the, uh, it was hard type the best kind would be ones that are designed specifically for your ear, and they can take a mold of your ear and, and do that. Uh, this one outfit I saw, they actually used uh, uh, scanning technology. After you cleaned out your ear, actually to model the inside of your ear canal. And they would produce a plastic earplug that would go into your ear, just like that, and, and fit perfectly. And it even had a little bit of electronic, if they used 3D printing for it, used a little bit of electronics in there, had a little tiny microphone. So it could actually do active noise reduction, like Bose headphones, in these little earplugs as well. And so it's a blocker, and it's also active noise reduction. Maybe we'll get a chance we'll talk about that at some point. So here you go. Here's the, and you can see custom fit earplugs that are designed specifically for a person's ear. Okay, and there we went through the foaming, and there we the Oh, look, it's same, same video. Okay, so fit testing. How do you test whether or not this is really effective? For the most part, uh, you're not going to see much fit testing done with these kind of devices. The assumption is, is that if you get them to fit correctly, you assume what the noise reduction rating, you assume how protective they are based on the manufacturer's noise reduction rating. But it's not the same thing as taking these headphones and putting on somebody's head, producing a noise, and then measuring the level of sound inside the headphones and outside the headphones. Very similar, you guys may have seen respiratory fit protection, where they do that, right? You put the mask and you sample the air inside the mask and outside the mask and compare them. So you, you actually can test that, do a quantitative test. 
they can do that with these things as well. Most, most situations, they don't. They rely on the noise reduction rate. Since you're not really testing how good they are in a particular individual, you have to discount the noise reduction rate uh, uh, so you don't so so you can be positive that you, you get a minimum amount of noise reduction even if they aren't quite perfectly fit. Okay, so and uh, the frequency response depending on the type of device you have, you're using, it might have a better response of reducing sound levels at different frequencies. Again, octave band analyzer help you figure out whether the device you're using for detecting the worker is really appropriate for the kind of sound or frequency of the sound that you're exposing them to. Okay, selection and protection of sound level, work environment, uh, how often they expose the excessive noise, uh, how durable does the device have to be? And when you have them on the job, uh, if you have these things on, and you, you're still gonna say, be able to safely do its work. Okay, noise reduction rating. Okay, usually they'll have a tag like that on, either on the packaging or the device itself. There wasn't, it didn't say anything on the, in the plastic packaging for these, right? It wasn't, it was on the box. You know, if you saw the box that they came in, that would be on there. Okay, and I think this, this might be typically, looks like it could be earplugs, box, you know, box of earplugs. In fact, the noise is on the earplug package. Okay, so 29, 29 uh, uh, noise reduction rating of 29. Well, what does that mean? Okay, OSHA requires that the noise reduction rating be adjusted prior to job site evaluation. Okay, uh, 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 field attenuation, in other words, that's the level of exposure to the work or the assumed level of exposure to the work. Well, what's it equal to? It's equal to, that, that's how much of the attenuation, it's how many decibels you've reduced the noise. Uh, uh, it's equal to the noise reduction rating minus seven. Okay, so if our, if our earplugs were 29, minus seven is what? 22, right? Then we divide that by two, we're down, and now we have 11. So the field attenuation, the amount of decibels you've reduced the sound is 11 decibels, right? okay. So, um, um, uh, noise reduction rate of pair of earmuffs is 30 decibels. If the sound pressure level in the plant is 97 decibels, will this provide adequate protection according to OSHA? OSHA or according to ACCIH, which is the same as the NIOSH. Okay, so what, what, would, the actual, what, what would be the functional uh, uh, field attenuation? Amount of decibels would reduce the sound for a pair of earmuffs that has a uh, uh, noise reduction. So 30 minus seven, right? 23 divided by two, 11 and a half. We're starting at 97, what are you down to? That's 85 and a half, right? That's right, 85 and a half, right? So is that enough? It is, right? If you use NIOSH, if you use OSHA, right? That's enough, you just gotta get below 90, right? What about if you use uh, the ACGIH or NIOSH standard, recommended exposure limit? No, you gotta get to 85, right? It's not enough. Right. So you need more noise reduction than the earmuffs, these particular set of earmuffs will provide in that environment. What can you do about that? You got to throw those away and get another pair? Is there another solution other than throwing them away? The earmuffs, they're expensive. They came with a hard hat. They cost money, right? They like them. You know, they're pretty. They have, you know, like New York Jets, New York Giants. They got versions of them, right? The worker wants to use, he likes them. They, he thinks they're cool. He wants to use them. Do we have to throw them away and get something else? How about if we combine them? In other words, is there anything wrong with wearing earplugs with the earmuffs, right? You can actually combine the noise reduction rating with those two uh, devices. Okay, noise rating on a pair of earmuffs is 30 decibels. Da, 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 which is probably it doesn't, uh, quite. Yes? Yeah, that's the OSHA specifies that. Why seven and two? Because, because number one, because you're not fit testing. In other words, in order to get that noise, remember they, they determine that noise reduction rating of 29 in a laboratory, right? They take, uh, they take a soccer ball that was Pele kicked it once and sat autographed, they take a soccer ball, they put the headphones over it, they put a microphone inside the headphones and they get it so it's perfectly fit, perfectly tight, pressed up against that soccer ball, and not really a soccer ball, but a fake head, right? A fake head. And, and then gonna measure the sound 
outside of the headphones and uh, 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 earmuffs and inside of the earmuffs, right? And the reduction is 29 decibels, right? But that's perfect fit. That's not a human head that's on a uh, simulator. That's in a laboratory. So now, if I could put them on your head and do the same measurement, I would know exactly how much, how good those are with your sideburns, your facial hair, your face shape. I would know exactly how good they are at reducing the sound level inside your ear, inside your ear, right? I would know what it is. I wouldn't have to guess. I wouldn't need that to tell me how much you your age. That's cumbersome to do, right? So instead, they give you what the laboratory rating is, a perfect situation, not fitted to a specific person, you know, preferably sealed up. And OSHA says, well, yeah, it's perfectly okay. You can do that, but you can't use that number 29. You have to adjust that number to this using this formula, and then you can be pretty much certain that you can deliver 11 and a half decibel reduction. Right? Even though it says 29, you can pretty much on anybody that is reasonably well fit with these things deliver an actual 11 decibel. 11 and a half decibel. Okay, that's not my judgment. That's OSHA. Right? Yeah. Number, one number, one number well, that's the point. That's the, in other words, you can't predict. I mean, you know, you have a narrow face. Somebody else has a round face. You know, who is going to work? Who's going to work? Should we use uh, so, instead of seven? Should we use five on your face and nine on his face? No way for us to tell. So they take the safe route. They they're looking at worst case scenarios, right? In other words, universal worker. We're going to use this number. This this we're going to subtract seven, divide by two. And we're going to use that number universally for everybody. A lot of people it may perform better. Right? In fact, I would hazard a guess for most people, it will perform better. For 80% or 95% of people, you get better than 11 and a half decibels. But for some small portion, you won't. It, you'll you'll get uh, uh, you'll get either 11 and a half or maybe even a little less, right? Because it's just the fit or whatever it is. It's just not working as well for them. And OSHA has been, I'm sure they've done research on this and they figured, you make you guys take statistics? Have you guys taken statistics? How many of you guys have taken statistics? Right? You talk about confidence interval, right? That basically, you want to know confidence and you want that 95% certainty that uh, you're, you're going to protect 95% of the workers at the level that you think you are, right? If there was really going to be 100, 100%, right? Well, then you, you take this noise reduction rating at 20, 29 and say it's one decibel, right? It was just ridiculous because then they wouldn't even be worth wearing, right? They wouldn't be able to assume any reduction. So this is this is a formula they've calculated would, would protect the majority of workers at that level at 11 and a half decibel reduction, right? Yes? Uh, are there any examples of uh, work that you think is going to get Yeah, I'm sure they do. I'm not, but I don't think OSHA, you know, I don't think OSHA's really caught up to that yet. So I'm not sure that there's any that are certified this way or have a noise reduction rating that you can apply to OSHA. If you guys find out different, let me know. I've never seen, uh, you know, like Bose headphones, they don't come with a noise reduction rating on the outside of them, you know. And also, they're designed for, you know, certain kinds, they're designed for general use. Uh, I know I've used them and like in a room with conversation, they don't reduce the noise that much. But on an airplane, with that constant buzz of the engine, it almost completely erases it, right? So they're designed for environments where, you know, we're in a car or something like that, a moving vehicle, you know, or something like that. They really seem to work pretty well. But in other environments, they don't seem to work that well. And you saw that graph that showed that those earmuffs at low frequencies, they don't really attenuate much, but at higher frequencies, they attenuate quite a bit. Okay, proper use. Uh, uh, okay, and you don't want them removing them. You want them, you want them to keep them on, right? Exactly, this is... So you, if you guys, you know, uh, I, uh, tomorrow is uh, uh, the 18th anniversary of 9-11, uh, right? So there's been a lot of pictures, you know, like on Facebook, I've seen a lot of photographs and pictures from, from nine, you know, the post, uh, post the weeks or months after 9-11 and the workers and so on and so forth. And I can't tell you how many pictures I see. A lot of us went down there and did fit testing, you know, helped them with fit testing and stuff like that and, and gear and stuff. For the workers that were doing the cleanup and the, you know, especially after the immediate uh, uh, disaster, 
you know, there were a lot of damage. It was a recovery operation for a couple of weeks. They thought they might be able to recover some people. Unfortunately, they weren't. But uh, so they were working on the pile very vigorously trying to see if they could rescue anyone. And uh, uh, so a lot of the firemen, you look at the pictures back then, a lot of the firemen, nobody's wearing. They're wearing their respirators. They're using dust masks. And, you know, most of them, they got them all in their heads and stuff like that. They were desperate to get through. You know, like see if they could rescue somebody for the first couple of weeks. No one was using protective gear. You know, and that you know, there's all that, all of that uh, uh, concrete dust, and the, uh, uh, which is uh, highly alkaline and abrasive, and probably full of silica and asbestos and and everything else. And there's the fumes from the burning plastics and stuff. So uh, when you look back at those pictures, you'll see that, uh, especially early on. Especially in the first, in the in the few first few weeks, first month, that uh, a lot of the first responders, a lot of the people went down to work on it, on the pile. Uh, we're not wearing protective equipment at all. If they were, they'd only be able to wear it. Only it's still pretty warm. It's still September, right? So there were warm days. It's tough to wear that stuff when it when the uh, when it's hot. Uh, so uh, and it was hard to spend much a lot of time, you know, using those things. And they would clog up quickly, right? A lot of them were particulate uh, filters. And there was so much dust in the air that they would clog quickly. So basically, they almost you couldn't wear them, you couldn't breathe through them anymore. Okay, so hearing protection, not hearing protection. Uh, hearing aids do not block out enough sound for most workplace noise. So hearing aids not going to help you. Okay, some hearing aids can actually increase the noise level at the air. They're basically just amplifiers. The microphone on the outside they amplify the sound. They preferentially might not um, amplify the sound. What, what frequencies do you think that they amplify the most, right? If you have a hearing aid, you want to be able to talk with people. So it's in the range of, you know, vocal communication, maybe 400 hertz to 4,000 hertz or something like that. So that's where they work the best. They amplify the sound the most. You don't want noise amplified. So they, they, they work specifically in that range. Yes? Yeah, I have a question about that. So is, it, is there any selectivity in protection in general, and I'm thinking about like having a construction worker wear hearing protection and not being able to hear an alarm or a car, a, a right? Truck back yeah, up. yeah, you know, is there, yeah. Is there an octave band? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't think so for like warning signals and stuff like that, or sounds like that. I don't think so, but they definitely each different kind of device has its own signature in terms of like what, how, what, what octave, what frequencies it will reduce, attenuate the most. Like this, this is we're looking at earmuffs. And you can see that down at 125, 250 hertz, right, they're not, they're not attenuating the sound as much as they are in the rest of the band. Right? They're not as good as filtering out uh, low frequency sound as, as higher frequency sound. But other devices may be better at that. You know, maybe earmuffs, maybe plugs are better at that than the uh, earmuffs are. So recently uh, at work, uh, we've been using this new vendor, I don't know how the name, uh, they're doing custom fit. Oh, no kidding. They claim that uh, the, the volumes are broken uh, on one to nine. Yeah. Do they, did they, they give you a noise reduction rating with them? They did. Um, but, really yeah. Friendly. Look it up. But yeah. It, yeah, look it up. Because it's all about fit. Fit's important. It, it, he emphasized how it was so important to, to get that rolled up, make no creases in it, or get it tight. You can't put it as deep in you know, put it in the right yeah, well, those so custom fit. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like I said, I, I this is another outfit. They, they actually printed 3D. They would scan, use a an optical device, scan the inside of your ear, and then they would 3D print earplugs that would fit your ear, ear canal perfectly. Yeah. yeah. Did they clean out your ear? No. Yeah. Oh, they put okay. They put a mold device. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, so some sort of plastic material. Yeah, that, 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 okay. Yeah, and then pull that pull. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's reasonable. Would have been nice to clean out your ear. Take, you know, right. Shave out all the. They do. If you go for a hearing aid, that's exactly what they do. They clean your. Anybody watch uh, uh, sun, uh, uh, CBS Sunday Morning? Ever? They just had. Um, I'm trying to think of the name. They got. He used to be the uh, technology editor for the New York Times. Um, tall, skinny guy. And he went and got fitted for a hearing aid. He 
you know, they, they, the part of this story was about uh, the story. I'm hearing it, how expensive they were, how the technology is changing. And they literally, they use the camera to go in there and, you know, clean out all the hair and the hair wax and so on and so forth before they put the mold in to uh, create the, uh, the hearing aid. They do that for hearing aid. That's why you spent $5,000 on hearing aid. And then you, they do audio, audiometric tests in a booth to make sure that like it fits right, it's responding correctly, and that the particular device is tuned for the frequencies that you've lost and so on. So, so uh, it's not just a matter of just making, giving anybody one of these. But on the other hand, that means making a five grand or six grand means that 90% of the people that need a hearing aid, they don't got one, period. They don't, have a, they don't have a bad hearing aid. They don't have a not very good hearing aid. They don't have a sort of good hearing aid. They have no hearing aid, because right? it's just they can't afford $6,000. And who needs them? Usually, uh, you know, people that have done uh, work in noisy environments, probably not high wage labor and stuff like that. And, uh, and since they're not covered by Medicaid, they, uh, Medicare or Medicaid, uh, then they just don't wind up getting them. Uh, okay, okay. Um, now, uh, uh, hearing loss is supposed to be reported on the OSHA 300 log. Does it show up all the time on the OSHA 300 log? Probably not, because what happens when, uh, wh when does a guy realize that he has significant hearing loss, right? After he retired, right? Or when he's gone to another job 20, 10 years later or something like that, right? So it's not the kind of, and, and in general, occupational illnesses are underreported compared to injuries. Injuries are obvious. You fall, you break an arm, you're out for a week, and stuff like that. So, so those are obvious. Those, those get reported pretty reliably. Fatalities, there's no missing of fatalities. So you know they're 100%, don't miss any of those. But occupational illnesses, things like hearing loss, uh, are definitely underreported. Okay, so let me see what we can close out with. Okay, so here's a sound contour. We're talking about mapping out the sound. These are sound, sound contours. So with sound level meter, they've gone around and they measured where is 94 decibels. So 94 is here, 94, I read 94 in all these spots along this line. So you can actually predict that as you walk through here, this is like, um, I'm gonna make numbers. This is, this is 90 decibels. And then as you cross this line, you get 94 decibels. 96 decibels, 100 decibels, so on and so forth. So draw con use that to map out contour lines.